Hey YouTubers, I wanted to share with you this morning, I say morning, it's morning for me, I wanted to share with you a video I did of really just a quick sketch. It, um, it's a technique that I really like to use for any subject, but especially the figure, I love to work in silhouettes. And what's so nice about it is that we actually see in terms of silhouettes. People do not see in terms of line. We see in terms of large, big shapes. And so if you can come in and block in a figure using just a large silhouette, it really take, it does most of the heavy lifting for you because immediately you can already see relationships between the disparate parts of the body. And so it's just a great way, especially if you're working from life, if you're on location, or if you've got a live model somewhere, there's usually not enough time to just sit there and do a really complex drawing and then come on top of that and paint. So using a technique like this, learning how to use it, get comfortable with it, it just makes it where you can go out in the field and do portraits or do whole figures and get just a, a, a lovely little painting done that you're really very proud of. And you could do it in a, in a place and in a time when you wouldn't have thought that possible. So right now you can see that uh, I've just tried to block in my figure all in one big shape. I'm using uh, three colors, probably uh, alizarin crimson, uh, phthalo green, and phthalo blue. And for the background, just ab around the figure's head, I, I think cerulean. But uh, I'm not trying to uh, get local color at all. That's not something I'm even interested in at this point in the painting. Uh, just getting the large shape is all that matters to me. Then, when that is reasonably dry, I can come back on top of it and begin to do my second pass, the first pass being the mid-tone. The second pass is then your shadow shapes. Now, within the shadow shapes, I'm not concerned about differentiating between the coat, the legs, the shoes, the arms, any of that. It's all one big shape. And what's really good about that is it can make what can often be a very complex subject much more simple to grasp, much more easy to get your head around. So by ignoring everything to do with anatomy and everything to do with local color and concentrating just on the big shape of the shadow, and that shadow shape runs from the head to the feet and everything in between, so you're just trying to simplify it to that one big shape. And you'll notice, too, that as I'm doing this, again, I'm varying the colors just like I did with the initial silhouette. There's not a total rhyme or reason behind the colors that I'm using. Um, again, in this instance, it's probably alizarin crimson or quinacridone violet. I I'm leaning toward thinking I was using quinacridone violet instead of alizarin crimson, but regardless, it's uh, that with uh, probably phthalo blue and phthalo green. And the only reason the top is green and the bottom's blue violet is that I did the bottom blue violet and to give it some differentiation from top to bottom, I just changed to the green. I could have flipped it and gone the other direction, and that would have been perfectly fine. I just chose not to. Again, it, it, it doesn't matter when you're painting. For the most part, it really doesn't matter what color you use. All that matters is are your values correct. 
if your values are correct, then the painting will read. The different pieces, parts that you're trying to paint will look like those parts because you've got the values right. So, you know, if you weren't looking at the photograph, I mean, obviously you know that the guy's probably not blue and green, but you don't know what color his coat is. You don't know what color his pants or his shirt is. They can be anything we want it to be. And it's the same with the, with the flesh. It's, uh, uh, it's the values that we're, we're interested in. That that's what helps us to see uh, and differentiate between one shape and another. Now, I'm using Chinese calligraphy brushes. Uh, I really like them. They hold a lot of water. And you can just paint a lot with them before you have to reload. And uh, I just like the feel. Uh, these came from Blue Heron, uh, a nice small uh, company out of California. I uh, don't remember the guy's name. He's a uh, Chinese guy that uh, he paints in a traditional Chinese manner. But um, you can certainly use his brushes for doing traditional Western painting. And that's what I actually do. Most of my watercolors I do with uh, Chinese calligraphy brushes. I just really, really enjoy them. This is Arches Paper. I'm not real experienced with Arches. I use, traditionally I've used Canson Montval and Langton. And they are wonderful papers, as is arches. One of the reasons why I'm doing this particular painting is just getting myself used to the arches paper that I have. Arches is 100% rag, which means, well, it's all cotton and there's no uh, wood fiber in it. But the other thing, what that means from a practical standpoint, is that if you're painting it's going to stay wet longer and it's going to encourage what's called capillary action, which basically just means that uh, the paint can migrate from one area to another very readily. And that's not the case with Canson at, or, yeah, with Canson at all. There's very little of that because it's got such a high wood pulp content. Uh, so you don't get a lot of bleeding, you don't get a lot of blooming. It's much more, when you put your paint down, that's kind of where it's going to stay. Langton has, I believe, a higher rag content, I'll have to, or has a rag content, uh, but it's not 100%. And uh, if I'm wrong, you can correct me in the comments, but I think that Langton is mm, just a partial rag content. It's a wonderful paper. And it's a good transition paper if you're used to something like Canson that's got a high wood con pulp content, then you can come in with Langton and sort of transition over, and that's kind of what I've been doing. But now I'm trying to use the arches that I've got, and I'm just having to get used to it bleeding from one area to another. And, of course, that's not a problem if you're in the studio. If you're in the studio, you just use a blow dryer. But if you do a lot of plein air painting like I do, unless you happen to be inside somewhere where you've got access to an outlet, well, then you just have to let it dry the way it dries. And that could mean that an area that you put down uh, could bleed over into another area that you thought was done. So you just have to learn to... Uh, be used to the characteristics of that paper. Now you'll see here <clears throat> that I've picked up an op opaque paint and started applying it. And that opaque paint is casein. I love casein. It's a wonderful, wonderful paint. It, um, again, is a great transition paint. If you're used to being an oil painter and you really want to move into watercolor, but you're, you're just sort of intimidated by it because you're just not used to working from uh, light to dark or you're just not used to the way the paint reacts. Canson, not Canson, K 
casein is a great paint to use to help you along and make you more confident with your watercolors. Because what you can do is just use your watercolors, paint until you've painted yourself into a corner and you just can't figure out how to do it with, uh, with the watercolors. Well, then just pick up your casein and start painting opaquely. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, casein is very, it's not, I don't know that it's acidic, but it's got ammonia in it. It is, it's, it's just got ammonia. And that ammonia is brutal on natural fiber hairs. So you don't want to use it on anything like sable or ox or just anything that's a natural hair. So you want to pick up a synthetic brush and go to town. Uh, be sure, though, to wash it afterwards because even the synthetics will be damaged over time with casein paint. And also casein paint, when it dries, it dries what's called closed. It's give it a day or so and it cannot be reactivated with water. That's the diff one of the differences between casein and gouache is that gouache is like watercolor. It can be reconstituted literally a thousand years later. Casein, give it a day, give it two at the most, and it cannot be reactivated. And so it's just going to be there. So if it dries in your brush, you, know, you got a dead brush. But um, yeah, yeah, I'm just using the casein. I'm using Richeson uh, caseins. They, they have a wonderful brand. I'm also using that little bitty brush is a case is a Richeson travel brush. Uh, I really like them. They're, um, well, they're a little awkward to use. I'll admit that because their handle is so short, but there again, that's the whole point is that they're, they'll come in this little set. They're not terribly expensive. Uh, and they're a good little brush for what you get. And you can, um, put them in a very small pack and carry them with you and use them for, in my case, casein, you could use them for gouache or acrylic if you wanted to. But the main thing is they're a great little travel brush because they're just so compact. Now, I'm not going to carry it much further. Uh, again, this was not designed to be a really complex, involved, detailed painting. It's really a sketch. It's a a primer, something to warm me up and get me ready to go out and go to maybe the Dixie National Rodeo or some other event where there may be people in costume. And if you can photograph, that's great, but it's really nice to sit down and actually paint someone from life. And if you're using a technique like this, uh, it makes the odds that you can do that much more uh, realistic. If you've enjoyed this episode of The Arthropologist, please hit the like button. And if you'd like to see more episodes like this, think about subscribing. I'm Bill Wilson, and I'm The Arthropologist.